Hello and welcome to Bring It In with Morgan Campbell. This is CBC Sports' new weekly video podcast. I'm your host, Morgan Campbell. A little bit later on, you're going to meet our regular panelists, two outstanding people. Uh, I'm not going to spoil it just yet, but you guys will enjoy them. So Bring It In, let's get into the title. Bring It In is typically what a coach would say when he or she uh, wants to gather his or her players around the coach uh, after a practice, before a big game, after a big game, after a loss, after a win, uh, to let those players know what to expect, how to roll with the punches, how to deal with the big win and move on to what's next, how to let go of a big loss and move on to ne what's next. And so what a lot of what we're going to do here to a certain extent is going to deal with what happens on the field. But again, the big uh, the, the the big buzzword these days is the intersection, the intersection of sports and race, intersection of sports and business, the intersection of sports and politics. Uh, the shortcoming of the word interse intersection in this context is that it implies that uh, these different topics come together um, in an orderly fashion in the way that in any intersection in a city uh, is is regulated by stop signs or by traffic lights. What we know, especially having watched the last 18 to 24 months unfold, is that these topics don't come together in an orderly fashion. They're often less of an intersection than a demolition derby uh, or a traffic jam. And so what I and what the panel are gonna try to do every week is uh, help readers and help listeners, I'm sorry, uh, make sense of what's happening and maybe turn a demolition derby into more of an intersection so that we can understand how these different pieces fit together. Sports events, on the field action that has off the field implications. And a lot of what we'll also talk about are events where sport is a setting um, or a messenger or a vector for something else. We had a huge example of that last Saturday, Staples Center, Los Angeles, where 54-year-old Mike Tyson fought 51-year-old Roy Jones Jr. in an eight-round exhibition fight. And now, on the surface, it is uh, just that, an exhibition fight between two very old, but very accomplished uh, boxing Hall of Famers. Um, but it was also an infomercial uh, for a mobile app a video sharing app that whose ownership has some really strong connections to the Trump administration and is more than knee deep in this feud between Donald Trump and China. And to help us understand what was happening inside the ring and outside of the ring, uh, we're going to bring on our first guest, first guest in the history of uh, Bring It In with Morgan Campbell, one of my favorite people in this industry and somebody I hang out with in real life, uh, boxing writer, boxing historian, boxing filmmaker, Corey Erdman. So Corey, explain to our audience how Mike Tyson and Roy Jones are supposed to help Triller unseat TikTok as the go-to short video mobile app. Well, I, I have a lot of questions about just how this event actually factors into what Triller wants to do, because as right. you put it, this whole event was basically an infomercial for Triller, which is an app that is trying desperately to compete with TikTok. And it is doing that in a financial sense, it's poaching a lot of creators over, it's spending a lot of money on this particular event, but as of about two weeks ago, I think it was still sitting in the 500s in terms of the app store rankings. So you look at what they did with this event, they're putting on a boxing event, and it's a boxing hmm. event that is filled with popular black creators. Well, that kind of flies in the face of the politics of Thriller, <laughs> because as we know, it has deep ties to the Trump administration. It has uh, come under fire for not removing QAnon-related disinformation. Uh, its politics are in stark contrast to what they put out there on the screen. So not only do I not know who they were trying to recruit, but I don't know what the financial plan is. Do they plan on continuing to put on boxing events? Because that's something separate from trying to get people to download Thriller. Mario Lopez kept saying on the broadcast, TikTok is for kids, try Triller. And I kept thinking, well, TikTok is for kids, and that's the point, because it's not people my age who make these mobile apps popular. So what could Mike Tyson like possibly add to um, Triller's reach and to their depth and to, 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 to their demographic um, database? Well, I, I think on a very surface level, the one thing that this event did, I think, effectively do is give some re name recognition to this company in general. I think that at this point, TikTok is kind of ubiquitous. People 
you know, even people our age, people older than us, they know that TikTok is a thing that exists. So that word is out there and it has some recognition. Triller doesn't really have that. But when you stage a fight with Mike Tyson, you get <laughs> mainstream press. And mm -hmm. so at the very least, even if it wasn't mentioned verbally, you know, the, the step and repeat sitting behind Roy Jones and Mike Tyson when they're doing these interviews, when this is flashing across news broadcasts and, 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 and plastered in papers across America, that logo is at least out there. So on a, on a very basic level, I do think that there was some value to making this happen. However, when you look at the, the amount of money they spent to put this event on, I mean, we know roughly that Tyson made $10 million and Roy made three. Then you factor in the production, which frankly looks spectacular. That's Absolutely. a lot of money that got sunk into just doing something for name recognition. I downloaded Triller when Talk of This Fight first came up just because I wanted to see what it was. But do I use Triller? No, I don't even use TikTok. I draw the line at Instagram. And for people in their 40s like I am, I don't know that I'm unusual. Yeah, and it's, it's, that really is the question, is how does this now translate to downloads? One way they could do this, and frankly, they couldn't at this point, but one way they could is say, the only way you can watch this fight is if you download Triller. If Triller were somehow a different platform than it actually is, uh, perhaps that could translate to more downloads, but they know that in order to make the money back and to potentially profit off of these events, it still needs to be on linear pay-per-view you still need to be able to go on your box and download it that way yeah. the way that you always have so I, I i have those same questions but i do think that at the very least what it has done morgan is kind of scrubbed the image of what thriller was because in the weeks yes. leading up to this event you know again we we, we talk about the the q and disinformation that has been just riddling the app uh the company had uh, inflated the numbers, the number yes. of download numbers. Uh, and in general, it just had negative press leading up to this. And I think that at the very least, the, uh, I don't know, public perception of Triller has kind of cooled off after this event. Mike Tyson was burnt out on boxing in his first career. And so now he comes back, it's like a novelty, it's a second honeymoon. But you mean to tell me that every three months, you're going to get this 50, 54 turning 55 year old man to get himself into shape and get himself in a mental place where he can um, trade punches for what? For charity? To promote a mobile app? And again, that is best case scenario, assuming he doesn't tear an Achilles tendon uh, walking up the ring steps. But like long term, um, we kind of forget that the, the uh, the point in the appeal of a novelty fight is that it's a novelty and not a regular thing. Well, I think they did play very well to nostalgia. You know, when I looked at my timeline, everyone was was loving it in the moment and they were debating and and hearkening back to the days when they ordered <laughs> those Tyson pay-per-views and the Roy Jones Jr. fights. So as far as like how long can you stretch the appeal of nostalgia, I think pretty far. I mean, we're seeing with the music battles that are going on, you can basically right. dig up any two artists that, that people used to like or still like, and we can kind of reminisce and, and debate them. The problem is they're not using actual human currency in doing yes. that, you know? Yeah, you know, Gucci Mane and Jeezy Glad don't have Gladys to go Knight. in and fight one another. Yeah. <laughs> Gladys Knight and Patti LaBelle did not fight each other. And, like, they would sing over the vocal track because some of those notes they can't hit anymore. <laughs> right, right. In, in this case, I mean... Like, if you're asking me, can they do this again with Tyson versus Holyfield? Absolutely. And will they do good numbers for it? I think so, too. But I think that at some point, there is going to be a ceiling for this. Corey, before you go, let the people know where they can find you. All right. You can find me on Twitter at Corey underscore Erdman. And uh, you can find my articles on Boxing Scene each and every week. And uh, I'm probably popping up on a TV pretty frequently calling fights around the world. So if you want to watch real fights, those are out there, too. And you might hear my voice on them. Perfect. Thanks, Corey. All right. Okay, guys, so I promised you uh, a panel, two people that I really like and enjoy and respect, uh, who are really going to make this thing sizzle and cook every week. And I promised it, and I'm going to deliver. Uh, the toughest part for me is figuring out which one to introduce first. Um, so I'll just go down my screen. I see first things first. So usually, I'll be at home. might be a Sunday, maybe Saturday morning. And I'll get a text message because my mother has figured out how to text message on her iPad. I'll get a text message or I'll get a phone call. And I, when, when I get a phone call, I know it's really urgent. And I would say half the phone calls I get from my mother on a Saturday or Sunday morning, I pick up the phone and she says, Morgan, 
Dave Zirin's on MSNBC, turn it on right now. And so that's how I know <laughs> to go flip the TV to MSNBC. Uh, so this is my mom's second favorite sports writer after me, I hope. And the thing is, it might, it, it might be a closer competition than we're letting on. But Dave Zirin, when you, again, when you talk about the intersection of sports and all the important topics, like Dave Zirin is the name that comes to mind. He's the person uh, directing traffic at that intersection and the guy that can make it all make sense um, with passion and with humor and a ton of intellect. Like we've worked together before. Dave's brain is like my external hard drive. If I forget a date, Dave jumps in, I throw it up to him like an alley-oop, he finishes, and there it goes. Now, Dave is the author of 10 books, and he's got an 11th on the way, The Kaepernick Effect, that comes out sometime next year. Dave, say hello to the people. Hello to the people. My goodness, after that introduction, I think I'm too good for this show. I think I'm leaving. <laughs> Don't leave, Dave. We just got you here. I and um, <laughs> and our, our, our second panelist, uh, somebody I really uh, respect, and I'm really proud of, the thing about our second panelist is you will never catch her without multiple jobs. So when I started knowing uh, our second panelist, she was a journalist around Toronto, but she also had day jobs because a lot of times journalism in the early stages of your career doesn't pay the bills, doesn't keep the lights on. And sometimes she would call me for advice about how to prioritize which job over the other job. I don't know how good my advice was. I just remember her uh, calling me to get the advice. And now, uh, she's all grown up. She's in DC. And again, when I talk about someone with multiple jobs, she is the play-by-play -play person for the Capital City Go-Go of the NBA G League. She is the play-by-play -play person for the Washington Mystics. Uh, she's a contributor here at CBC Sports. She might have another job. It's tough for me to keep track of them all. And the other thing about her is that she's a visionary because when she was here in Toronto, doing play-by-play -play on the Raptors 905 games. And I would ask her why she's not doing analysis because she's a former college athlete, played basketball at Humber College. And usually the former athlete is the analyst. And she said, no, 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 sir. I do play-by-play -play because play-by-play -play travels. And analysis doesn't always travel. I can take play-by-play -play anywhere to any sport. So this is what I'm doing. And she's doing it really well. I want you guys to welcome uh, our second panelist. And this is no particular order, but second panelist, Megan McPeak. Morgan, thank you. I, I feel like Dave, we're we he set us up for for, for failure with these intros. Mm -hmm. Like the, <laughs> the bar has been set so high. <laughs> Listen, I wouldn't set you up if I didn't think you could clear the bar. So let me ask you guys this, and anyone take this question. What is your favorite uh, Nate Robinson meme from last weekend? Ooh, <laughs> there's too many. <laughs> like there, in all honesty, like there, there is too many, but it's probably the one with that everybody uses. The one with Simba. Lion King is one of my all-time <laughs> favorite movies, and when the internet drops that one, you know that the internet remains undefeated to this day. What about you, Dave? I mean, I just like the phrase "Nate, Nate" for night, night. I think that <laughs> one is going to be tattooed to poor Nate for as long as uh, he walks among us which is such a damn shame because in yes. Nate Robinson, you have probably the most unique athlete that the NBA has given us in my lifetime. You look at, I wish less people would look at Nate Robinson getting beaten up by a YouTube star and more people would Google Nate Robinson top 10 NBA plays and watch him block Yao Ming. Absolutely. And he, Yao Ming was almost two full feet taller than Nate Robinson. Like Nate Robinson is not a tall guy, listed at 5'9", which probably makes him about 5'7 and a half. Um, and to your point, like a unique skill set, like this guy, three-time slam dunk contest champion, also a division one football player, also probably like a 10-4 sprinter in the, in, in the hundred meters. Like you don't see people like that every day, but what you learn is that boxing is a unique sport. And what matters more than your 40 time or your vertical leap in boxing is experience and timing. And Jake Paul might not be a professional boxer, but he trains boxing like pretty much full time and knew and he knew what he needed to do uh, to counteract Nate Robinson rushing at him forehead first. So my question is this guys, this deep into the pandemic, because remember, we can remember back to spring, which now feels like six or seven years ago, you would see novelty events because every single league was shut down. There was no um, NBA. There was no major league baseball when we thought the season would start. NFL was off season anyway. Even like big individual sports like 
boxing was on hold. Mixed martial arts was on hold. And so you would see these novelty events. You saw the guy from Game of Thrones trying to break the deadlift world record, all of this. Um, but at this point, with all these sports back online, for better or for worse, like, do we still need these novelty events? Yeah, Morgan, uh, let me tell you something. I think we desperately need these novelty events. Uh, because <laughs> sports, oh, yeah. Because first of all, a couple of things. First of all, sports has always had one foot in carny culture, particularly <laughs> boxing. And we shouldn't yes. pretend that sports is somehow... I mean, sports is in some respects, it's a high pursuit. It's a place where you see a weather vane for politics in our world. Uh, it's a very important area to study. But to see, think sports is just that in some sort of hermetically sealed precious space where only sociologists dare tread is a big <laughs> mistake because it also has a foot in carny culture. It always has. And particularly these times where, you know, the NFL can't necessarily promise that it can get a team on a field and where college sports seem racked by disease and people are desperate for escape, then absolutely we still need some novelty sports. And frankly, we need them even if the pandemic isn't happening because life is hard. Life is difficult. Hence the number one uh, role of sports beyond even showing us the way in which the wind is blowing in the political world, the larger role of sports is distraction and entertainment. And so if someone's willing to put it together, I think a lot of folks, including myself, are willing to watch. So Megan, what's a basketball related novelty event you would like to see either sometime over the next six months or in the event that we have to press pause on, on the upcoming NBA season? I mean, one of the events I, I personally have wanted to see at, you know, All-Star Weekend has been bring back the legends and play like a, a, a two on two game. They kind of <laughs> like when they when they had at All-Star Weekend where you had, you know, the current NBA player, um, a WNBA player and then a legend and they did the shooting competition. That yes. was one of my favorite events because you got you got to see the legends of the game who if you're in the era where all you know is a LeBron or a Kevin Durant you don't necessarily know what they did on the floor so to see them still be able to you know knock down shots like I would pay to see a Grant Hill in a shooting competition so like spice it up and maybe give me two on two in in that sense but you know I'm I'm in a way with Dave on this in the sense that there is clearly a niche market for novelty events I mean when there was no pandemic we saw like that celebrity boxing. And it was consistent of celebrities thinking they could get into the ring. However, unlike Nate Robinson, they had more than just a couple of months to train for this. I actually think if Nate had given himself a year to train properly and not have to rush it, I, I don't know if he gets knocked out in the first 30 seconds. Maybe it's the second or third round, he still gets knocked out. But I think it then puts him on a level playing field where he had the same amount of time to train and he could actually be prepared for counteracting what Jake Paul did to him and maybe not just getting, you know, one, two and down on the ground and now turned into a consistent meme on the internet. But I think there is a niche market for these novelty events. Do I personally like them? Not necessarily because I think it makes a joke of some sports. If you're a celebrity getting into boxing, which I have trained for, uh, on the boxing end just simply for getting in shape, not to actually fight, just to simply get in, in shape. Because I know if I thought I could step foot in a ring with someone who <laughs> actually technically trained and wanted to fight but wasn't a professional fighter, my butt would be dropped just like Nate Robinson was. I know there is a technical st standpoint that not all, just because you're a top tier athlete does not mean you can get in that ring and does not mean you should get in that ring. Everybody has a plan until they get punched in the face. Nate Robinson had a plan, he got punched in the face, but there is a huge gap between what you're able to do against a punching bag and what you're able to do against a human being. And mm -hmm. these novelty fights <laughs> often <laughs> bring that to light because what you and your trainer do on Instagram does not matter if you can't, catch or block or slip or parry a jab because if you can't do that you're not going to go far in boxing 
Yeah, and much to say about that. I mean, first and foremost, I think it's also a reminder that, you know, people who have these foolish takes, like if LeBron wanted to play soccer, he'd be the greatest goalie in the history of the World Cup. It's that, no, sports don't necessarily translate. Nate Robinson's one of the great athletes I've ever seen on a basketball court. That doesn't mean it translates necessarily to another sport. And we should, I think, lose the idea that any world-class athlete can somehow magically translate their skills to something else. Uh, that's the first thing. I mean, yeah, it doesn't translate at thirty at thirty seven years of age, right? Well, true. If you want to say that at, if Nate Robinson had started boxing as a kid, would he be a world champ? Absolutely. But at thirty seven, after two months of training, no, it's not. It's absolutely not going to translate. Go ahead, Dave. Yeah, m maybe we we would see that if he started early. That would be an interesting test as well uh, to see if it would be the same kind of situation. Uh, the, the second thing I think we got to realize is that when we do these old timer events, uh, we're always playing with fire. Like, um, Megan mentioned the basketball piece. I mean, I'm old enough to remember the last time the NBA did five on five full court old timers basketball. <laughs> and it resulted in Rick Barry sucking on oxygen, Connie Hawkins, not able to dunk, and then David Robinson, David Thompson, I'm sorry, the legendary David Thompson tearing his ACL. And then they just canceled it and said, we're never doing this again. <laughs> this has to stop. So I love the idea of a two on two, a three on three. I love the idea of seeing the old stars out there, but let, let, let's not push them too hard because uh, sometimes that, that results in, uh, in not exactly great television viewing. Hey, the, the big three is one of my favorite events to watch. I've actually gone to it. Uh, I had a, a friend that played in it and that gets the former athletes right at the, at, at that right age where they haven't officially retired. Some of them right. from the NBA, they still want to try and make a roster, but when they realize that father time has finally caught up to them, that they've got this other outlet. So I love that, you know, ice cube credit to him for coming up with this idea. And honestly, it is a very fun event when you go to it in person, if you get a game where it comes down to, literally a game winner like what what we saw from from joe johnson this past one before covid you know shut everything down he was literally iso joe from what we saw him in the nba on a weekly basis and torching guys and it was fantastic entertainment and basketball as well too so i think you have to get them at the right age where they're not completely past their prime and you know, there's that risk of injury, but they're still entertaining and they still want to play. But, you know, today's point, you don't want to get them too, too far down the road where we've got an oxygen tank on the sideline and potentially surgery coming as well. Too. So we also had some history made last Saturday. Sarah Foley, the goalkeeper on the women's soccer team at Vanderbilt University, was promoted essentially to the men's football team to play place kicker in Vanderbilt's 41-0 loss on the road at Missouri. History because Sarah Fuller becomes the first woman to play in a Division I Power Five conference football game. So in a lot of ways, it's a huge deal. Um, in a lot of ways, it makes me feel a little bit uneasy and for nothing that has anything to do with Sarah Fuller, but more to do with the circumstances that led to her getting promoted. But Sarah Fuller, she's been bitten by the football bug. She wants to come back. Vanderbilt has one more regular season game, I think, against Georgia this weekend. Georgia is very good. Uh, Vanderbilt is at the opposite end of that spectrum. But Sarah Fuller says she's ready to stick around. She's ready to keep kicking. Megan, what did you think of Sarah Fuller making history for the Vanderbilt Commodores uh, at Missouri Tigers last weekend? So I'm going to do this in two parts so that there is a distinction in what I'm saying, because a huge respect goes to Sarah Fuller in, in what she did and making history. And also this coming off of an SEC soccer championship. So it's not like she was just sitting around waiting. She had just finished her soccer season, won a championship with the soccer team, and then was given a couple days to prepare for a game, a football game. And when it comes to kicking, clearly she knows what she's doing. So a huge credit to her, very big congrats to her because what she did was absolutely phenomenal in pushing forward and bringing women's in sports. I do not, you know, discount anything she did on the field. Like you, Morgan, what my issue is, is I question why Vanderbilt did this. Again, as you said, what led up to her getting this promotion as you mentioned, going from the soccer field to the football field, a string of COVID-19 right. tests 
that Thank were you. positive that ran through the football team, especially their special teams, which prompted them to have to need someone. So I question why Vanderbilt did this. It has absolutely nothing. I repeat, nothing to do with Sarah Fuller. It has everything to do with the PR look of this and why they did it, why they picked her, because you took a clearly negative situation and put a beautiful historic spin on it. And I totally question why they did this because it took a moment that should have been amazing. And it now has a little bit of unfortunate connotation around it because of the steps and events that led up to her making history. That is the only issue I have. It has absolutely nothing to do with Sarah Fuller as an athlete. The whole history of sports is about odd opportunities that are gained through bizarre means. <laughs> I mean, we only know who Lou Gehrig is because Wally Pipp got sick. Poor Wally Pipp. <laughs> you know, we only know that Jackie Robinson broke the color line because Branch Rickey said, you know, not only do I want to make money off of black ticket goers, but I want to raid the Negro Leagues and turn it into a husk <laughs> of what it was. Uh, Cassius Clay only became a boxer because someone stole his bicycle. I mean, these bizarre events take place that thrust people into the spotlight, and then it's about what happens inside that spotlight. So I think this is a moment like, yes, it's completely completely tarred by, by how college football is responding to COVID. That's, of course, a part of the story. But the fact that Sarah, I mean, Sarah Fuller could have been asked and said no. I mean, she stepped up to the moment. And that's what I think we need to celebrate right now. No yeah, doubt. Absolutely. No doubt at all. It, except the thing that I can't get around is that, and we talk about this all the time, Dave, but these players aren't paid, right? Mm -hmm. So when you say, uh, pay college athletes, then the response is we can't pay the college athletes because they're amateurs, or the response is they already get paid because they get tuition, they get room, they get board, they get books. Okay, cool. So now, Sarah Fuller is on scholarship to play soccer. She's on scholarship to play football, right? So she's doing something going above and beyond the terms of her scholarship. For what? How is she getting compensated for this, if not in cash? Because you can't pay them cash. Does she get extra books behind this? Does she get an extra year of tuition? An extra year of room board? Does she get to start grad school because she bailed out the football team? She should, but right now what she's getting paid for are, what she's getting paid in are, are, are pats on the back, which is cool, but it's not a material benefit in the same way that this football team benefited materially from her decision to bail them out. Well, I mean, I'll, I'll always be somebody who says, and I've said it so many times, I practically have rickets in my jaw for saying it. Uh, <laughs> but, you know, I think college football and college basketball, which depend on black bodies and black labor for their success, are basically an elaborate mechanism to steal billions of dollars of black wealth from the black community, because that money is going not in the direction of the people whose blood, sweat, and tears make it all happen, but it's going in the direction of, of overhead, of facilitators, of coaches, of, uh, of directors, athletic directors, and the like of it, when it's clear there's enough money to go around, but the system is dependent on indentured servitude, and it's highly racialized. I'll say that a million times. All that being said, uh, I think that Sarah Fuller I mean, she is not just getting a pat on the back. I mean, I think that that undersells what she did. She's now etched in the history books. And if I was a friend of Sarah Fuller, I would be saying to her, you need to be dining out on this for the next 20 years. You are the first <laughs> woman in a power five conference. You know, that doesn't end when you're 21 or 22. Uh, you know, that, 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 you know that, that mark on you is something that you're able now to wear proudly um, for time immemorial. And I mean, and it's a lot of pressure. And so that's the other reason why I give her credit, because I think a lot of people a lot of people, male, female, what have you, when asked to, to be a first, I mean, it's not uncommon to see people shrink from that moment. And the, the, the idea that she stood up for it and to it uh, is something that's going to be remembered. Final segment, in or out, quick hits. I asked Dave, I asked Megan, quick question. They tell me if they're in on it, if they're out on it and why. Um, first question to you, uh, Megan, Raptors in Tampa, as opposed to someplace closer to Toronto. Dave, you in or out? Oh, I'm in. Let him go to Tampa. Let him not pay state taxes for a year. It'll be a nice bomb <laughs> after 
uh, Canada's um, hefty lean on, on their finances, which by the way, I do support because I believe in national health care, but at the same time, give them a year off from that. And and also I got, a, or I don't even know if they have a year off from that. That's just me being glib, but also, <laughs> you know, it'll have them a chance to be in the warm sunshine during the winter. And so, I mean, COVID has, has wrecked so much of what we know about traditional sports. So you might as well give some of these players some sunshine. Megan, you in or out? I, I'm, I'm in. Why not? Like my biggest thing to date point would be the, the state taxes. Let me save some money in my pocket and, and keep it in my pocket, especially too, when you think about the fact like they're used to being in Florida. They did the bubble in Florida mm-hmm. when before the bubble, when the Raptors went down to get prepared for the bubble, they were in Florida. So they're used to that area. I'm, I'm totally for it. I know Raptors fans would like to have them closer to home, but at the same time, there's no guarantee fans are going to be in the building. So if they can get mm-hmm. some sun and, and save some money at the same time, Time, I'm all for it. I am out for continuity's sake. Put them in Buffalo, just like the Blue Jays went to Buffalo. And I understand that Buffalo has these harsh snow filled winters, but that's the point. Yeah. Like I said, continuity. Like if you're a person that likes your four seasons and you kind of set your watch to what's happening outside, you're going to have all these NBA players who still think it's the off season because they're going to leave their house in February and it's still 80 degrees Fahrenheit, uh, 29 Celsius. Continuity sake, and because I have a big soft spot uh, for Buffalo and anything good that happens for the city of Buffalo, I support. Um, sorry, Tampa. I'm, 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 and, and, and it's not a decision I reached easily, but I'm out on that. Um, uh, they're playing in Buffalo. The only continuity will be no free agents signing in Toronto. <laughs> exactly. Shout out to Buffalo, the 11th province. Uh, this is where we warn people that Dave's opinions do not represent those of bring it in with Morgan Campbell. Uh, Dave is a, a private operator. Uh, they're getting ready to tear down the Rogers Center, downtown Toronto. And there are a couple of potential sites for a new stadium for the Blue Jays. Are you guys in or out on a brand new retro style outdoor baseball only stadium in downtown Toronto? Dave. I am. Oh, oh. I'll make I am, I am ahead, all the way out on this one. First of all, it will always be the Sky Dome to me. I don't care <laughs> how much money Rogers gives them. It will always be the Sky Dome. There is absolutely no need for a new stadium. That is the home of the Blue Jays. It will always be the home of the Blue Jays. They won back-to-back World Series there. Touch them all, Joe. This is your moment. <laughs> I am all the way out. Dave. I mean, I have to be all the way out for a couple of reasons. One, I believe in history. And so the house that Cito built needs to stand. <laughs> uh, that's the first thing. The, the second thing is, you know, I, I don't trust how these stadiums get financed. I don't think it's a fair burden on the people of Toronto in terms of how it gets put together. You have a perfectly good stadium with a wonderful history in the Sky Dome. Stick with what you got. If you got to refurbish, refurbish. But let's not go in with the Camden Yards in Toronto kind of situation. Stick with the Sky Dome. Stick with the house that Cito built and stick with your history. I am out only because. I watch sports as if I were there. And so because we live in Toronto and the weather is inhospitable for much of the year, cold and rain together are a crappy combination. I would rather see, if you're gonna replace a Sky Dome, some type of retractable roof, indoor, outdoor stadium. You can't do that if you build an old school uh, Maple Leaf Stadium replica. And so that's the main thing I'm out of. I'm, I'm out on, but today's point, yes, I recognize that financing these stadiums is always, always, always a mess and it always winds up costing regular people who don't even get to use that stadium much more than it should. Um, and for that reason, uh, I'm out too, because I'm not eager to see Toronto taxpayers bear an extra burden. Um, but what I would love to see is a stadium downtown in a perfect world that Rogers paid for since they own it and since they own the team, um, but that also shelters long-suffering Blue Jays fans from the elements. And that's where we'll leave it. Pilot episode, premiere episode, first season of Bring It In with Morgan Campbell, new video podcast at CBC Sports. We'll be back in the not-too-distant future with the same panel and a new guest. Really, really hope you guys can join us.
Bring It In with Morgan Campbell is hosted by me, Morgan Campbell, and produced by CBC Sports. Special shout out to my man, Corey Urban, again, one of my favorite people in the world and in this industry, and also to Dave Zirin and Megan McPeak for helping us make this happen.